This is Dr. Ted Hildebrand teaching his New Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, Lecture Number 1, Introduction to the Course and the History of the Persian Empire up to the time of Alexander. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ted Hildebrandt, and I'll be the instructor for this uh, course on New Testament History, Literature, and Theology. It's taking place at Gordon College, spring of, spring of 2012. Uh, today, we just want to introduce the course, and then we'll be talking about some history, some history that plays the background for the New Testament. We'll be going over, starting with the Persians, and then uh, working our way down to the Greeks, and then through the Greeks, Alexander the Great, on down into the Hasmonean and the Maccabean period, and then down on and finishing out with Herod the Great, who wasn't Jewish, but, uh, and we'll talk about that. So largely be a historical survey to set the background for the New Testament. As we get started, let me begin this way with the New Testament. There's certain Old Testament foundations that you've got to have in order to understand the New Testament. So when the New Testament opens up with John the Baptist saying to Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That is an incredible statement. And if one does not understand from John 1.29, if one does not understand John the Baptist's statement of the importance of the sacrificial system and the cult that came out of the Levitical movement of Judaism in the Old Testament, then when John says, Behold the Lamb of God, you don't really understand what he's talking about. So this course, because it's in the New Testament, will assume some knowledge of the Old Testament. And um, that includes, then, um, the statement, Behold the Lamb of God, or look as the NIV translates it. But then next, uh, the climax, Jesus Christ, is the climax of many of the Old Testament institutions. And so what you have is the first institution in the Old Testament would be that of the prophet. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses is going to say that there's going to come a prophet like him, and God is going to speak through that prophet. Jesus Christ, there would be many prophets that would come after Moses. You'd have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Huldah, uh, many of the prophets of the Twelve, the Hosea, Joel, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, those kind of prophets. And they would then lead toward the prophet who is going to come, and that the prophet who would be to come would be, well, in one sense, Elijah, who is to come before the Messiah, but then the Messiah himself be considered a prophet. And so Jesus is a prophet. He is the logos of God, whereas the prophets say, thus saith the Lord, Jesus will say, and John will say of Jesus, that he is the logos, he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And this word or this revelation, this logos is going to speak uh, the prophetic message, not uh, in physical terms, not in, in words, thus saith the Lord, although Jesus will speak in words, but Jesus will speak by his, the incarnation. He will incarnate the word of God. So Jesus is kind of the ultimate prophet, the ultimate revelation of God, where now you have God in flesh speaking. So Jesus is the climax of the prophetic institution of the Old Testament. Uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the last statements on the Old Testament. As the Old Testament is winding down in Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, around 400 B.C. or so, he says, there's coming a time where this prophet will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And so Malachi tells them that basically Elijah will come before the day of the Lord. So that's why when Jesus comes on the scene, many people say, are you Elijah who is to come? Because Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the very last chapter of the Old Testament, tells of and predicts of a prophet who would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now Jesus is going to say, I'm not Elijah, but he's going to say that John the Baptist comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so John the Baptist will be the kind of the forerunner who announces Jesus would come. And so John the Baptist is Elijah, if you will hear it, as Jesus says. So Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 ends the Old Testament. It kind of ends there, looking forward to there's coming a prophet who's going to um, announce the day of the Lord and coming things there. 
So that's Jesus as the climax of the prophetic institution. Jesus as the king. Jesus will come as David's greater son. And so David will, Jesus will be the son of David. And many people say uh, in, in Hosannas, as they're singing as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, they will say, Hosanna, the king, son of David. And the son of David goes back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, where it talks about uh, a son of David who would sit on the throne of David as king over Israel, and he would rule forever and ever. And so Jesus Christ will be that greater son of David that they're looking for. And so when Matthew starts his book in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And so the son of David, uh, as Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, and so basically Abraham was told that he would be blessed with land and a seed, that his seed would multiply and that he would be a blessing to all nations. That blessing to the all nations comes through Jesus Christ and that he would be the son of David, that is, he would sit on the throne of his father, David. And so Jesus Christ is going to play that role as king, and Jesus Christ is going to be king. Um, and even um, Herod, when the Magi come uh, to Herod, they ask, where is he that has been born king of the Jews? And, uh, of course, that would be Jesus. And when Jesus dies, toward the end, they'll ask him, are you a king? And they'll say over, over his head at the end, they'll say, you know, here's Jesus, king of the Jews. And the Jews will object to that, of course, want the sign to be taken down. But uh, the rulers will say, no, the sign stands as I've written it. And so Jesus Christ will be the king, the greater king, and ultimately uh, fills that role. Now, the third institution that Jesus kind of fulfills is that of a priest. And the priest, basically, the problem you have with Jesus is that Jesus is, because he's the son of David, he's from the tribe of Judah. And the tribe of Judah, they didn't do priests and things. The priestly tribe was the, pribe, was the tribe of Leviticus. And so what you've got is this, this conflict between how can he be king and how can he be a priest, because if he's a king, he's going to be from the tribe of Judah, from the line of David. But if he's going to be a priest, he's got to be a Levite of the, of the tribe or the line of Aaron or the Zadokian priesthood uh, from the Levites down to Aaron, the priest down to Zadok and things. Jesus is not a Levitical priest, however. And actually Hebrews picks this up later on and says, wait, Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was a king priest and Abraham paid a tenth of all he had in the book of Genesis. And so Jesus will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And what does a priest do? A priest, basically, you work with the sacrificial system and, and the cult and the sacrifices and the festivals and things. The priest was the intercessor between God and man. The priests were the one who taught the Torah, who taught the law of God to the people. And they basically made intercession for the people through their sacrifices and things. The people would bring the lambs and the lambs would be slain and they would offer them up on the altar to God. Only this time the priest is not going to take a lamb and offer it up on the altar to God. This time the priest himself is the lamb of God and he is going to offer himself up. And so you get Jesus as the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So just want to basically do that kind of in a cursory way, just to say that as we look at the New Testament, we're going to keep saying in many points, how is the New Testament foreshadowed and what kinds of depth come from understanding the Old Testament that will provide us with a depth of tradition and understanding that we need in order to understand in, with depth the New Testament. So we really need to understand the Old Testament because many of those things, the prophets, the priest, and the king, those institutions flow right into the person of Jesus Christ. The whole sacrificial system, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And by the way, that tells us Jesus, right up front, Jesus' main function, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is not going to conquer Rome. Jesus is not going to move through a big movement, create a big movement for social justice. Jesus is going to be removing sin uh, through the sacrifice of himself. 